Hi, I'm Margret. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to multidimensional arrays. An array is a container object that holds a fixed number of values of a single type. A multidimensional array is a nested array. A two-dimensional array, for example, is an array of arrays. A three-dimensional array is an array of two-dimensional arrays, etc. Two-dimensional arrays are often used to represent matrices or tables. Let's look at an example. Let's say we have a two-dimensional array, we call it table, and it consists of two rows, row 0, row 1. Now remember, a two-dimensional array is an array of arrays, so each of my rows is an array itself. Here I have row 0, a character array A, B, C, and D. That's how it would look like in memory. We have we have a local variable, row 0, that refers to an array object which includes elements in a continuous space on a heap. It is a widely used practice to draw arrays top to bottom because most people think of two-dimensional arrays that represent tables as an array of rows I'm going to draw my arrays left to right. This time I draw it left to right, it's only a different representation, nothing changes in the actual allocation of memory. It's just meant to make it a little bit more intuitive. Let's add the second row here, row 1, E, F, G and H. We're adding a second local variable with another reference to another array. At this point I'm going to shift everything around a little bit to make room for my third array, my two-dimensional array table. Notice I have two pairs of brackets here because it's a two-dimensional array and I initialize it with row 0, which is an array, and row 1, which is an array. So you can see an array of arrays. Let's have a look at the memory. I make a stepwise approach here, just for clarity. My table has a reference to an array with two elements. Notice an array with two elements. But at this point, we haven't initialized it yet. So my first element points to row 0. My second element points to row 1. Let's see how we could access array elements. Let's say I'm interested to access B. You can also see it right here in memory, B. Notice there's two references that refer this array. One is a reference from row 0. The other one is a reference from array that is accessible from my table variable. A little bit indirect, but still accessible. So let's see, how can I access B? I can look at the indices of my array and I can see what well, it's index 1 of my row 0. And so I could say, well, this is row 0 on index 1, which is nice. I was accessing through this bottom reference right here. Now let's say I don't want to access it through the row 0, or maybe I don't have access to row 0. I want to see how I could access it via my table, my two-dimensional array. Now I'm going to look at the indices of my different array elements from my table, and I notice it's the element on index 0 that references the array that includes B. So here I have to go to table, index 0, and then within the array that was referenced I'm accessing index 1. So first index 0 and from index 0 to index 1. That's where my element B is. Let's try another example. Let's see if we're interested. How can we access G? I'm going to my table. This time I have to go to my element on index 1, which is my second element. I'm following the reference and 0, 1, 2, here on index 2 I find G. So you can see table, go to index 1, then 
go to index 2. That gives you G. Now it's your turn. How would you reference D? Take a moment to think it through, pause the video. When you're ready, press continue. So here you can see, we go to the table, we access the array that is referenced on my zeroth element, the first array that is accessed, and I'm going to the last element here on index 3. So, table 0, 3. This is how I can access my element D. Now let's have a look how we can access an element in a given row and given column. Let's say we want to access the element in the third row, second column. Here I want to point out the different way most human people count starting at 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, versus the way programmers often count starting at 0. Here my index starts at 0, 1, 2, and also in this direction is 0, 1, 2. Now if I want to have the third row, this would be my index 2. If I want to have the second column, this would be my index 1. And the element that is both in the third row and the second column is my element on index 2, 1. Now it's your turn. How can you access the element in the fourth row, third column? Take a moment to think it through, pause the video. When you're ready, press continue. So here you can see the fourth row, which is index 3, and the third column, which is my index 2. So we have to access index 3, 2. I also want to introduce to you nested array initializers. So far, we have used a regular simple array initializer, and we just passed two existing arrays. That worked fine. However, many times I don't really need row 0 and row 1 variables because I don't have any particular use outside of my table. A nice and easy way to initialize a table is with a nested array initializer, just like this. So inside my array initializer that has the two curly braces, I have nested array initializers, one for my first row, then a comma, and a second one for my second row. One semicolon at the very end to terminate my statement. Let's have a look at jagged arrays. Notice we have once again the two pairs of brackets. In Java, multi-dimensional arrays are arrays of arrays. So there is nothing that enforces that each row has the exact same amount of columns like you would expect it from a table or from a matrix. I can use the exact same syntax in a different context. Let's say I want to have an array of the children of different families. So here, those are my cousins. You know, one family has three kids, Mike, Maria, Marco, another one has two, another one has four. In this situation, I have an array of three arrays, and each of those arrays has a different amount of elements. Three, two, four. If my arrays have different amount of elements, we talk about jagged arrays, because here you can see it doesn't make a rectangular shape, it has this jagged shape, even if I would column it out nicely. Let's say I would like to access cousin 2, 1. Which one would it be? Once again, we have the same pattern. First index shows us which array we should choose. So we have 0, 1, 2. So we're in this row here. Second index shows us which element. So 0, 1. We're talking about then. Let's say I'm going to reverse my two indices. I say which one would be cousin 1, 2. So I'm trying to figure out 0, 1. I'm in this uh, array here. Now I'm referring to my element 2. I have 0, 1, 2. 
that will be right here. Now here is no element. If I try to access cousin 1, 2, I get an array index out of bounds exception because this index is out of bounds, doesn't exist. Last but not least, I'm going to introduce you to printing two-dimensional arrays, but we're going to do that in the IDE. Here I prepare two rows, both are of type integer for a little variety, and I'm going to print row zero directly just so you can see what will happen. System out print line row zero. And when I compile and run, you can see this gives me the default implementation for two string with a hash code, etc., but no information about my actual array elements. However, Java provides a class called arrays. It's in Java util, so I import it. I say import Java util arrays. And this arrays class has a whole number of static methods that are very useful in combination with arrays. They let us search and sort and copy, and they also allow us to get a string representation of the array. So rather than just printing row zero, I could say arrays to string, and now I have to mention which array should be represented in this string. So I want the representation for row zero. And when I do that, I will see my actual array elements. That's what I want. I could do the exact same thing with my row one, and then I would, oops, see both of my rows printed out. Now I'm going to create my two-dimensional array. I call it table, and it is uh, row zero, row one. So here, table consisting out of two rows. Once again, if I try to print it out directly, that doesn't work too well gives me what we would expect, a default representation for two string. But I want to know the elements. So I could try to use the same trick. I could say, well, why don't I just use a raise two string on my table? Because that worked so well for my one-dimensional arrays. And when we try to do that, it gives me the two string method applied to the individual elements which is twice my hash code based default implementation of two string. Not really what I want. So here I'm going to use a for each loop instead. I say for each integer array row in my table, do the following. And we figured out already how to do that before, so I'm going to take the same good idea and reapply it but we don't print row zero or one in specific, we just print whatever row we are on in our for loop at any given point. So I'm going to um, comment out my previous print statements just for clarity. Let's compile, run, and there we are again. Here's my table, row by row. Let me also demonstrate the excess of elements. So here I could say, for example, my integer number is table one, two. So this would be my index one, index two should be number seven, right? Let's print it. System out print f number percent d percent n number. File, run number seven as expected. And if I would take some other index, let's say I want to have the fourth element, but I forget to consider that indices start at zero, it still compiles. But when I run it, I will get an array index out of bounds exception. 